This this whole battle that's going on in Wisconsin, I've been trying to get to the root of it. It's difficult. The The media is playing a fairly big role in this. Yes, indeed. And uh, I'm glad we've got our author on today. And the book is Shakedown, the Continuing Conspiracy Against the American Taxpayer. Stephen Malanga is with us. It's always a pleasure. Stephen, thanks for hanging around. My pleasure. You know, one of my favorite aspects of this story, the favorite, in quotes, uh, the media misreporting of it, is they're throwing around, well, A, that there's no difference between private enterprise unions, private worker unions, public unions. The and governor the of thing. Wisconsin is trying to destroy the United Auto Workers, for instance. Right, right. And the fact that they're throwing around the word rights all the time. They're yes. trying to take away uh, their rights to collective right. bargaining. Yeah. Well, I think you're right about both things. First, first of all, uh, it's it's really amazing the way they sort of you know talk about the entire union movement, uh, and there is a right because of the Wagner Act for those in the private sector to collectively bargain. There is no national right for those in the public sector. When FDR signed the Wagner Act, he specifically said you can have collective bargaining in the public sector, and everybody agreed with him back So the right-wing anti-labor president, FDR, yeah, that's right, yeah. thought uh, that the that public union shouldn't uh, have collective right. bargaining. Right, and uh, obviously so did the Senate, uh, so did Congress at the time. Uh, and yeah, so, good point, because they had to pass it. Yeah. Right, and, and, and so what happened then was that collectively, collective bargaining in the public sector was granted state by state, and this is why, for instance, 12 states don't have it at all. That's kind of one of the ironies of these things. They're talking about what Walker is doing is as if it's unprecedented, but 12 states don't allow any collective bargaining at all in the public sector. Uh, another 26 allowed just partial collective bargaining, and just five years ago, Mitch Daniels in Indiana rescinded collective bargaining for state workers with nothing like what you're seeing right now. So it's hardly really unprecedented in that respect that, that the Media. What's unprecedented is the media kind of attention on this, which I understand because we have a whole series of reform governors elected in, you know, in November. That that, that it's a big story, but it's hardly as unprecedented as it's being made out to be. So help us understand the money trail. How does this shakedown of the taxpayers occur specifically for folks who are not hip to it? Well, I think there's two things in particular. You have this big government coalition of public sector workers and social advocacy groups who essentially always benefit from bigger government, and that means more spending, more programs, and the higher taxes to support them. And over time, we've we've kind of lost a perspective on what size government do we need to actually serve us. Instead, it's always they're, they're the frontline advocates. If you look at the public sector unions, they really have the resources, so they're the ones running the initiatives. California is a good example of this, but Oregon, Washington State, um, they're either running initiatives or they're running campaigns that's uh, uh, about bigger government and more tax spending. The social advocacy groups have been kind of the sympathetic part of this coalition for years because they're the ones that put out all the reports saying, we have this problem, isn't it terrible, we need to spend more money on it. And we spend more money on it and things don't get better. And then they say, put out a new report, we we have to spend more money. So they they are kind of the, the, they have produced what I call kind of a a uh, non-ineffective government in America because we have so much government spending that over 30 and 40 years hasn't it has never addressed uh, adequately the problems that it's supposed to address, and it just keeps going on and on and on. Because if you cut it, then you're being, in, you know, in some ways or another, uh, insensitive. Um, so, so, you know, we have job training programs in America that don't get anybody jobs, but we keep funding them because, well, of course, job training is... How can you, know, you be against job training, Stephen? Exactly. That, there you go. You just hit the nail on the head. It's very hard. I could be a great lefty. I'm considering it. <laughs> yeah. hey, do you do you think there's any likelihood there'll be any streamlining of the tax code anytime soon? Wow, you know, that's uh, that's one of my big hobby horses. I, that's a very good point, because in a way, um, one of the things we've done for the, in ter- is, as we've upped social advocacy is we've just completely destroyed the tax code and made it such a major headache for ordinary people. Um, and I, I count myself in this category. I, unfortunately, I have a wife who is self-employed, so our tax forms, you know, <laughs> are just a horror to... Uh, yeah, we've, we've talked about this a lot. It should be unconstitutional that the government is 
just taking our money and then made it so complicated, I have to hire somebody and pay them to figure out what I'm supposed to give to the government so that I don't end up on the wrong side of the law. And I've done pieces about how many times the IRS makes mistakes and drives you absolutely crazy. I mean, widespread mistakes, especially with things like the uh, the alternative minimum tax, mm-hmm. uh, sending out thousands of letters, which turned out um, based on an incorrect formula, so you had accountants all across the, uh, like in the Northeast saying, well, you're wrong. <laughs> you're just wrong. Stop bothering us. Here's, what, here's the way it should be. So it, that's a big issue. And the reason it's an issue is because what politicians have done is they don't want to say they want to spend money anymore, so instead they're going to give you a tax credit. So everything that they want to promote, they're going to, they're going to give you speech in which they say, I want a tax credit. So I think we have, you know, like, uh, well, I'll give you an example. The tax ex- extenders bill in December that was passed, it was being debated, they had 130 tax credits that were being extended. It's a game that they play, and that actually costs us money. It's not money that is being spent in the sense of, you know, where the government isn't writing a check, but it's money that's being spent because it's allowing all kinds of tax breaks, not necessarily for things that are really worthwhile, and that's the other part of it. Stephen Malang is on the line. Shakedown is the book. Uh, what, what what is the uh, what is the taxpayer to do? What is the listener to the Armstrong and Getty well, show to do? To you know, for? one of the things that I've uh, said uh, as I sort of gone around the country giving talks about the book is that taxpayers have to figure out a way to become a, a permanent presence. Now that sounds kind of absurd because we are, of course, the voters. But if you look at this country, we go through tax revolts like we went through one in the late seventies. Uh, California was a good example of it. And that tax revolt in the states actually helped to elect Ronald Reagan. We also went through one in the early 1990s. But what happens is after taxpayers successfully revolt, they do what they want to do, which is basically go back to living mm-hmm. in hives. And, you know, because you don't want to spend all your time on this. But it's clear what happens is that the, these other groups are a permanent constituency. And no sooner is a tax revolt done than they begin clawing back, you know, the reforms uh, until we wind up in, an, in an, uh, another situation. So I, I tell groups, you know, like I've talked to a lot of people. Party groups and stuff, you got to make yourself a permanent presence, even if it's just like you're a membership group and it's $35 or $50 a year, just so there's somebody watching. And it, you don't necessarily have to have all the sophistication of these groups and the number of people they have, but you need somebody watching to alert you. We, you know, in this kind of modern world, we have emails and blast mails. And it, it, Taxpayers have to be constantly alert because there are so many groups out there, many of them funded with government money, that are just looking to sort of claw back any reforms that you make. You know, I blame withholding. I've always blamed withholding uh-huh. on this. The fact that they take the money ahead of time, and then if you get 50 bucks back, you click your heels with happiness, versus if at the end of the year you had to write a check for it all. Boy, you'd see it. Boy, things would change fast if at the end of the year you had to write a check for the whole thing as opposed right. to it being taken out little by little. That would fix everything instantly, I think. Well, and there are other forms of withholding, such as, of course, automatically uh, deducting union, public sector worker union dues mm-hmm. for them and sending it right to them. You know, there are there have been initiatives even in California to 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 try to change this, and uh, it's it's kind of like the uh, neutron bomb of uh, uh, of public sector uh, policy, and the unions will fight really hard against that. Yeah. Then, Stephen, we're we're about out of time, but how much do you think uh, American life would change if? Every single worker had to pay income tax. Everybody making money <laughs> felt like it was their money. As opposed to half, which is currently the case. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right about that. That is one of the dangers that we face to democracy, I think, is that more and more people don't understand the implications of government spending because they are not being taxed. Stephen Malanga, it's always a pleasure, Stephen. Let's talk again soon. All right, absolutely. We've got all the information on Stephen's book, Shakedown, the Continuing Conspiracy Against the American Taxpayer, or armstrongandgettyradio.com. Go there, buy the book, read it. It's good stuff. That was really interesting. You are listening to... The- the Armstrong and Getty Show.